This morning, uh, it was occurring to me that one of the most important practices is to uh, experiment, at least, with the idea that ev- everything is absolutely and totally perfect. Mm. Um, and this one came out of nowhere for me on, on my own uh, path, because, you know, what could be more obvious than the fact that, of course, you know, everything is totally and completely fracked up, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, as my wife put it this morning, she said, don't we have enough things to worry about? <laughs> 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 and and uh, so, I mean, it's very counterintuitive. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it cuts across left, right, all religious affiliations. The world is something that needs to be fixed, mm-hmm. And so I thought one of the things that might be good to share is this at least experimental approach to the idea that everything is totally and completely perfect. Hmm. You say experimental. Yeah. What do you mean? Well, uh, one of the things that seems to happen, if you say to somebody, you know, everything is completely perfect. Uh, <laughs> what, they, what they stop laughing. Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, you know, after they, uh, you know, it's like perfect. Okay. Is this perfect? You know, and yeah, then they, yeah. uh, How perfect is this? um, that there's just such an enormous resistance towards, um, just automatically <clears throat> accepting that it's perfect. It's a little, it's very close related, if not identical, in fact, to the, uh, no free will discussion ah, that we have. had. It is Whereas if you say right away, Hey, you know, You're not in control. Just let go of that. You know, that is too much for most people to uh, really tolerate at first. It's like too big of a dosage uh, Mm -hmm. in some ways. Where if you say, hey, next time you feel frustrated, experiment with the idea that you can surrender and experience the fact that you're not in control. That's what I mean by experiment. You can experiment with the idea of like, hey, you know, most of my life, I've been waking up in the morning and most of my day operating according to the principle of, and this thing needs to be fixed, and this thing needs to be fixed. And the business model of businesses, religions, institutions of all kinds is built on this idea. Let us fix that for you. There's something wrong. And so, if you come, uh, you know, too powerfully all at once and say, hey, everything is perfect, get over it, <laughs> then... That's not going to have, nobody's going to have ears for that. Nobody's going to really incorporate and integrate that. But if you say, you know, this is a really interesting experimental protocol, you know, uh, you know, you can listen to somebody who has tried it rather like somebody who has tried to say a psychedelic back in their legal and say, Hey, this is really interesting. Try this little script that everything is perfect. Yeah. Now I, I, like everybody else, uh, I, I felt I was going to fix the world, or should we be responsible for fixing the world? And you don't look at that and consider the absolute arrogance of that assumption. That in fact, there's 7 billion people on the planet, and the universe, whatever that is, has been sitting around on our hands waiting for you to come along and fix the whole thing. Um, so you can start getting into to experiment, you know, okay, who is it that believes they can, they, they're they responsible for fixing this? I mean, just ask, who is it that is this person that feels they're going to be in charge of fixing the world? And see if, in fact, that that's reasonable, credible. Uh, to me, I, I, I backed into all of this stuff uh, just by doing inquiry. We've talked before, you know, just who am I, where am I, what is this? And eventually, as that whole thing fell away, when the eye falls away, there's no one there to run around and do something. No one that has this long-term vision of how to fix the world. And along with that came, as you pointed out, you know, no free will. Because there was no one to have free will. Just being in control, there was no one to be in control. Uh, there was just no one to suffer. There was no one to have fears. There was no one to have those kind of self-referential desires. So the whole thing just fell apart like a house of cards. But it was, it was just keep going back and looking. When you say, I'm going to fix the world, just ask yourself at that point, don't go out into the object fixing the world, because you can go online, you can see, you can spend 80, 30 hours today looking at all the problems the world has. Or you can take you know a few minutes and look back and say, okay, who is it that believes they're going to be fixer of the world? 
just feel into the eye of that and say, I'm going to fix the world. I'm going to fix. I'm going to. I'm. Go back into the eye and just say, okay, what does it feel like now? Begin to that space of, okay, what is this? It's looking at this presumption. And you just feel that. And you feel that space. You, you've done that. Just feel that space. And you feel there's nothing wrong with this space. This space looks like it's already perfect. There's nothing I could change in this space. And then something comes in, pulls it away, and you're up and fixing the world again. But you've had a little glimpse of something that really is perfect, because you can't find anything that needs to be done to it to make it any better. And when you're in that space, which is not the source, when you're a doer who is Mm. going about fixing the world, there's something which almost inevitably you're not doing, which is loving the world. Mm. You're, you're, You're not experiencing the world as world. You're experiencing the world as a doer who is separate from the world and is then going to get in there and fix the world. And it, and it feels like the reason why this can be a good experimental protocol to follow. It feels like if you can just say, yeah, it's, it's perfect, then that allows you to be in the world. And when you are in the world, that turning around and looking at the one mm-hmm. who is in the world feels feels to me a little bit easier. It feels mm-hmm. like uh, it's less clenched when when the world seems nothing but an ensemble of what remember John McCain called existential threats, mm-hmm. right? Then the ego is very good. The narrative mind, as we've discussed, is very good at saying, "Well, that's all well and good," but the tigers at the edge of the village. In fact, the village is surrounded by cyborg tigers, mm-hmm. right? Um, and there feels like, even though there is, this is false, it feels like there's no space to get still and turn around mm-hmm. and see it. Mm-hmm. And so the suffering then just continues. Whereas if you experiment with, wow, it's really perfect, you know, um, I can e- experience that perfection, you know, of a moment. In that moment, as a moment, it allows you to experience just a little bit of that space where nothing needs to be gained and nothing is lost. Part of the key to seeing it, too, is to watch where you are in your head, you know, what your consciousness is doing. If you're really present for now, not in a cliche like be here now, but if you really are no place else mentally in your consciousness, you are just here right now, there's nothing else pulling you off into the past, into the future... You're just here. Now, you can feel when you pull, move out of that towards something to do something. Oh, yeah. It feels so different from, you know, this being in the source is such a sweet place. And when you start to come out of that, then it's like, whoa, this is not cool. So the most perfect place you find is to be in that presence because it is so compelling. And the brain finds out it likes this. We thought more about this. The brain likes this. And the brain will refunctionalize itself. Or to support this. The brain's after pleasure and little pain as possible. And so this is the best deal in town. And it will go there, and the more time you spend there, the more it becomes really home. And coming out of that becomes really not okay. So it is clear that it is perfect, at least the best perfect you can find, and nothing else you can do is going to make it feel so good. And this is why dialogue is so vital, because, mm-hmm. um, you know, speaking out of my own experience when I would fall away or pull away or drop out of the feeling of the source, Mm -hmm. very often I would look to something in the world Mm -hmm. to get me back there. Mm -hmm. Say, ah, okay, all right, well, uh, you know, um, yeah. One of those. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And, and, you know, then then that wouldn't work, you know, so I would try another one. Whereas what's so interesting is that if you can, on a regular basis, enter into dialogue with someone else who is also entering into source, it's like you become two mutually corrective mechanisms where the, you, you feel yourself falling out of source and then the other person more or less un, well, unconsciously feels the other person and sort of directs the other person back to source gently. Mm-hmm. And then you feel it again, and then it has to happen. It seems to have to happen. I don't know how many <laughs> times, but um, 
but it's a really beautiful experience. And so th- then what can, uh, what, what's beautiful that comes out of it, as we've discussed is, uh, one of the reasons why on a very core level, it, it doesn't make any sense for teaching to cost any money when, if it doesn't need to, right. because this kind of dialogue is its own reward that as you fall away from the source, the other helps bring you back to the source as you, as, as they bring you back to the source, you help bringing them back to the source because even they're bringing you back to the source can be a little bit of a right. separate, a separating uh, ordeal. Well, as you found out, as you work with people, and if you work from source, you find that you get deeper and deeper because if you're if you're staying in source, then you're working with somebody. You are, at some level, pulled into source more deeply because you're trying to come out of this and express what you feel towards this person. And source is also in them. It's not just you don't have a special copy; they also have it. And so, the more you can come out of your space, the deeper you sink into it. And the more likely they are to be able to get coherent with you. This gets kind of woo-woo now. <laughs> as far as, you know, co- some kind of wavelength coherence between the two of you. And so the, both of you then become much more deeply immersed in the source. And yeah. much less likely to be pulled out. And that's where the perfection comes. When the two of you are in coherence, and there's just nothing else, you'd rather, no place else you'd rather be. There's no place else to go, nothing else to get, nothing else to bring in, nothing else to take out. It's perfect. And if you can let that be the experience between the both of you, then the whole thing really takes on a whole richness, and it is perfect. And and this addresses also one of the other kind of usual rejoinders to the idea that everything is perfect, which is the sort of, well, you're just living in your own world. Like, mm-hmm. I'm sure it seems perfect right. to you if you've managed to blot out the reality of a world with but you're bypassed. six billion people on the brink yeah, and, right. uh, you know, so on, saying, Absolutely not. The, the 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 contrary is the case. It's precisely by doing something besides living in my own world, right. which is fed by this. The world is broken. I need to do something about that. Right. Um, that sense of separation that you start to feel the perfection, and the perfection starts to manifest more and more. And we 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 get to see that, in fact this planet that we live on is this incredible unfolding of perfection. And insofar as we would ever dare to say that it's not perfect, it's precisely the effect of our not recognizing its perfection that is fracking it up. Right? Well, well and, and as you as you remain in source or in presence, you're still in some word you want to use, you find that the actions that come out, actions that manifest are much more prescient, they're much more organic, much more holistic than your fragmented mind's going to come up with. I mean, you can feel yourself moving out of, you know, moving out of source into fragmentation. And as you do, you can see the quality of your actions going down precipitously. I mean, they just immediately they start to fall off. We talked about how fast the feedback is. When you come out of source, you can watch yourself going through your day. It's like, whoa, clearly, you know, slap on the face, Bonk, you're back into source again because you can see very quickly how suboptimal you become and how fast it occurs. The slightest nudge and you're out of source, you get back in again. Right. So uh, when it comes to, say, questions of uh, politics, which is then the level at which we would start to organize and manipulate the world so that it can be fixed because of that premise Mm -hmm. that the world needs to be fixed, Maybe a good heuristic is, does this political activity keep me in source or does it pull me out of source? If it helps keep me in source, fantastic. If it pulls me out of source, shouldn't we watch, at least observe and witness whether or not uh, the goals are being served by politics, this, you know, I'm not arguing against politics. I've just noticed that a lot of times people make the move from the world needs to be fixed, and here's how, and I, along with a lot of other eyes, are going to act on that. Here's how, mm-hmm. and I mean, how many dry runs of that? How many 
case studies do we need to see people have been talking about fixing the world for 2,000 years, and if you look closely at any of these attempts to fix the world, they've at best done the opposite. 